So hello, I have great pleasure in introducing my lovely friend and colleague, um, Sarah Marsh, who is a pelvic floor physiotherapist and she's a senior yoga teacher. She's also a well-known uh, woman's health expert. So thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to be here and a lovely, lovely September day as well, isn't it gorgeous? It's so nice. It's so good. And it's, it's, it's always just lovely to chat to you. Um, I wondered if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of background, a tiny bit of background about yourself and then letting us know what are the main things that women bring to you in your clinic? Of course, my pleasure. So I'm retrained as a physio um, and a yoga teacher at the same time. Not sure I'd recommend that if I have my time again. <laughs> Going back sort of 15 and possibly even 17 years now. But prior to that, I'd worked corporately and being an accountant. So I think one of the things I've managed to carry through is that I get asked to present a lot. And it generally is, I mean, I do, I do really love it because what you do is you get to do a lot of research around subjects. So I feel it keeps me really current and up to date. Um, and I like to, you just get to educate and share things with people. Um, and I think, you know, we've talked as well, just being able to talk in the health and well-being space feels very much like a privilege a lot of the time. So I, sh I split my time currently in these COVID times between my clinic um, in Twickenham, but also doing some oncology physio at the Cromwell Hospital. So I'm looking um, men and women, but a lot of women with breast cancer who I'm seeing from an exercise and a rehab component. Um, and I have to say that they always make you feel it does give you perspective. So yeah, you, they, we have some amazing yeah. patients and I absolutely love that. So I think, you know, you asked me about what do I see and probably for both of those groups actually. So I tend to see women, after we've seen them postnatally, I think the next time you see them is when they start getting changes vaginally and things aren't working as they were before. So that might be bowel changes, it might be bladder changes, that might be frequency, um, it might be lack of control, it might be changes in consistency, it might be UTIs, because as we age, we do find that our muscles, we lose our elasticity, we, they lose their plumpness, so things come a little bit closer together. We know that menopause and women get some more regular UTIs, particularly if you have had a history of those. So we start to see those changes, but then we start to say that they're feeling very itchy, they're feeling very dry, it's feeling very painful. And it sometimes takes a little while, but I think quite often where we get to is either A, I can't imagine ever having wanting to have sex again if these women are single, or if they're in a long-term relationship, it's just not happening for me. And what do I do? Because I still find that I think it's still a really difficult area for us to talk about with our partners. I always think when you start a relationship, you talk about these things very early on. And then when you get closer to somebody, it's like, you don't mention it anymore. Um, and so a lot of them say they just don't know how to talk about it. So it's not that their partners wouldn't want to help or they just don't, haven't even had that conversation. So I think quite often what happens is that it becomes a, it's a bit like that. So they either aren't having as much sex or they're just not as happy doing it because, because they think it might hurt. And of course that then brings in all sorts of issues amongst itself. And our pelvic floor is very, very reliant on us feeling emotionally in a good place. I think from a sexual mm -hmm. connotation anyway. And, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking, in midlife, we tend to be these kind of, you know, the meat in the sandwich, don't we, with uh, stuff going on potentially with our parents and the stresses of, of looking after them as well as our own children. We often have work or our own businesses going on. Then we have social media and keeping up with everybody. There's so much going on in, in our head. Yeah. It's very difficult then for us to be able to just let go of all of that. And even if we didn't have a lack of estrogen, which yes, we do, um, we've got the, the mindset aspect, which is really hard, isn't it? It's got to be a conscious thing that we work on. So interesting. And, and actually, I would be delighted if we talk, you know, more about sex yes. in, in this talk. Um, and uh, like you said, the, the issues that come up in midlife when estrogen starts to drop down with the pelvic floor um, that can affect you know discomfort etc and therefore even the thought of having sex or being close can be quite off-putting can't it so could you talk a bit more about what what's actually going on with hormones and what therefore could show up in the pelvic floor because when you or just when you said itchy and dry I find that quite often those words don't actually describe properly 
the discomfort because you're like, well, dry inside is not that dry potentially, but on the outside it's dry. Um, and often women, yes, don't, don't really understand that dryness means literally a lack of elasticity in yeah. the muscle fibers. So could you talk a bit about that? Yes, well, I think that is actually really interesting because you might still feel that you have a little discharge, which we all have and is completely normal as women. So mm. I will have people saying, well, I'm not really dry, but then when I have sex, it feels a bit sandpapery and a bit ouch, which is, yes, yeah, so you're, they're like, well, am I, am I not? So we know that as our hormones change and our estrogen drops, and there's changes in progesterone, but, you know, estrogen being the main culprit here, mm. um, that that does, reduces the elasticity of our tissues, and for a lot of these women, they haven't done much in terms of pelvic floor strength. If they, they may not have had children, in which case, to be honest, possibly not done a lot of pelvic floor exercises, full stop. If they have had children, they probably stopped those 10, 15 years ago. So they haven't done an awful lot in that area. And of course, it's like anything. I mean, I remember years ago um, looking at a colleague. I went to a gym with a colleague and she was 12 years older than me and me thinking, oh, my thigh, my thigh, the muscle tone of my thighs or my skin tone will never look like that because I'm super fit hmm it's not the lack of fitness it's the change in collagen elasticity and it's like this is harder to look not so that if you think that through that's happening to your biceps ladies and your quadriceps it's happening to your vaginal muscles as yeah exactly it's happening to those as well and so that's the first thing so why would it not because they're muscles like anything else so that's the first change and then the lack of estrogen so it's not so much around almost the entrance of the vagina sometimes I think it is deeper in closer towards the cervix that all those changes are manifesting as well. So that's why you can sometimes find that it's okay initially on penetration, but less so afterwards. And I think when I talk to women about this quite often, so we talk about saying, you know, men, you know when a man is ready for sex, it's clearly very obvious now, um, but I do think they can be a bit point and click. Um, men because <laughs> I'm sorry I love that just, <laughs> and it's just but you know just and I say with that sort of that just you know as long as they have an erection and it's they pointed in the general direction and their work here is done kind of thing <laughs> and this again is not negative to men because I absolutely love it so I am at, this is not about being negative to men but if that's managed and, and as women we can in their mind and possibly in ours always have sex because we are the reciprocal we're the we're the you know the the, the area we're the people that take we're the one that takes that into the vagina so there's kind of a feeling that it should always work, but you alluded to it, it is so much more complex. So the busiest time mm. for all of these hormonal changes, we've got less elasticity, we've probably got less muscle bulk, if you like. We may, because our muscles are they're not as strong or you just haven't got as much tone. Mm. You've then, so you've got the dryness that can come from um, the lack of estrogen. Um, the fact that we're no longer having periods will change what's happening to everything that comes through the vagina at that time because that would normally there'll be other other sort of um other fluids that would come with it so that is minimized a little bit as well and then we're not working these muscles perhaps and then on top of that we are the meat in the sandwich or you know the tuna if you're if you're a veggie whatever wherever that be but um but you're, you've got all of these next and this is without covid isn't it so you've got all of these mm. external stressors and we know that if our stress hormones are elevated, they trump every other hormone. So if you are high in cortisol and that's not coming back down and you're not having any relaxation, then you're, all of the other things that need to be happening with your estrogen, your progesterone, the, relax, the relaxing so that you actually get your vagina ready to have sex, that is not happening. And women are complex. That's what I mean about it. It seems like we're easier from a sexual perspective, but we're actually not. So that's the first part of that. And emotionally, we do have to be in the right place. And if you are you know, struggling between sorting out the kids and this, that and the other, and not perhaps feeling so great about yourself because you might not be feeling so great. Oh, and now you're going to have sex. Oh, and I don't, you know, so it's not just the, the libido issue, which can be an issue. And we know that testosterone can be quite successful for that, just a little bit of testosterone for drive around mm -hmm. that and motivation and libido that it's it's also just time it's time sometimes isn't it and environment and everything as well mm -hmm. so there's all of that going on and then if you've had if these women have had any issues vaginally so perhaps there is a little bit of incontinence creeping in or they've had changes to bladder or bowel what i often see when we talked around this is it are the muscles weak or are they holding in an area so there might be there might be a bit of weakness but are they holding because we need our muscles to be able to go down and come back up again they need to be able to do through full range exactly i always talk about the bicep that's a full range mm -hmm. of my bicep 
it's not this it's all the way down straight in the arm all the way back up again so mm -hmm. if they're not using them full range because perhaps they've had some pain so you have pain with sex you're gripping you're gripping mm -hmm. here you're gripping vaginally you're probably not moving your diaphragm properly if you've had issues with oh my god i need to go to the toilet i need to go to the toilet i need to go to the toilet you're going to be gripping at some point because you're going to be hoping that your pelvic floor muscles are going to hold on for dear life so if you have any of those things perhaps you're constipated so most of us stop breathing when we're on the toilet and we're constipated mm. so again there's a holding mechanism so it's a balance quite often between length strength and not holding but all of those are going to feed into not helping sex feel any better at all mm, wow and then you know listening to what you're saying I'm like, yes, I, that's why I do the deep relaxation after each of the movements. And, and yes, that's why we put our pelvis up and we go into our long exhale. And that's why we want to open up the, the whole pelvic area. And, and yes, and, and you know, but I can understand that for you and I, we, we understand all these bits of the puzzle. Um, but listening for the first time, it can be quite yeah. overwhelming, can't it? It can be like, bloody hell, you're talking about sex? And I can't even tell my GP that I'm leaking when I'm running. I can't tell anybody because it's so shameful. Or I definitely cannot tell my husband that I can't poo properly at the moment because that's what, yeah. what's wrong yeah. with my body, you know. Yeah. So we're talking about whole holistic changes, which kind of do, you know, isn't just like put one piece of the puzzle back and everything else is fine. You've got to be looking after all these different aspects, which isn't hard, actually. It's just... Yeah adding in little bits and being a little bit honest and, and, and communicating. Um, but if you were to say to the people listening to this, kind of like a gold standard of self-care, when you're in midlife, your progesterone has dropped down, you know, you're not getting an ovulation every cycle, your estrogen is fluctuating and diminishing, your testosterone, your, your poor ovaries are not giving you the testosterone anymore. So we have a hormonal deficit there. That's already happening. Yeah. Could you just talk about what you would say? And we're assuming that somebody is able to potentially take HRT, is able to do some exercises, is able to, I don't know, change hydration, whatever else you would suggest. Could you, could you give us what is your... What are your top tips, if you like, your gold standard top tips of what women really at this age should be making time for? Um, I think mean, themselves, obviously. But yes, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, HRT is, is the first, is they, they, we need to consider it. I do think all women should consider it. It doesn't mean they have to take it, but they should get some good advice and information around it. I am amazed at how many still say to me, oh, well, it does this, it does that, it does the other. And I'll say, mm-hmm and not exercising or drinking three glasses of wine or smoking does a lot more. So I think it's really understanding your risk. Now, some of that they're going to need to go and see a good GP about, but you can be forearmed and forewarned about that the research is out there or the evidence is out there. So make sure you have the latest evidence. In fact, actually I might, well, I'm sure you have it, but make sure we post it so that they've got a link yes. to that. Yes, because yeah. sometimes, the I, evidence, that's yes, him, that's crucial, sometimes you need to take it to your doctor because they will not know, they will not know. And what HRT will do, of course, is balance out your hormones. And for some of us, or for some period of time, that might be the best thing. Because if it's not just what's happening bladder and bowel, but you're feeling rubbish, hot sweats, lethargic, mood swings, it's, it's possibly worth a try if there's nothing else going on. So I think we have to give people the information also to let them know that they can try a load of other things and keep that on the back burner and still come back to it, or they can try it now. And mm -hmm. but it's about doing other things. So knowing the facts around HRT, Actually, Sarah, on that, because we were just talking before about um, topical estrogen yes. and, and how that is different, different from systematic yeah. HRT, could you just tap on that as well? And in that, it can make such a crucial yes. difference to your sex life, can't it? So, so, um, so you take HRT, and these days most of us would take that um, by a gel on the skin or a patch from an estrogen perspective, and progesterone is usually a tablet. Um, and we know that taking it transdermally, the estrogen is very is much better for us as well. So we know that from any risks, it's much better for us. Um, then, but obviously that so that's that's helping estrogen everywhere. But what we didn't realise for a long time was that so topical estrogen is estrogen that you use either in a pessary that you and it's a tiny little pessary that you insert into the vagina through vagifem. Um, I forget the name mainly because mainly because I use vagifem. I forget the name of the resource. It, it, yeah, it is. It, 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 or something, um, isn't it? Um, 
yeah, of Oviston, Oviston, yes, Oviston cream is the I, cream. I personally prefer the pessary because I think it gets closer to where I want it to be. But the, the this is giving you a little bit of estrogen very, very locally around the vaginal area. So even if you took that every day, and that's not what the prescription says, you generally take it every day for two weeks and then every other, and then every three day or three days a week. Even if you did take that every day though, the amount of estrogen is that in that is less than two doses of normal HRT. Mm. So it is Very weird, isn't it? Two doses a, I mean it's it's so yeah it's so low dose I, i'll just add in there um uh about the oviston the cream mm. the one good thing about that for those people who are finding that the sphincter muscles of the of the urethra and the, and the anus are not closing well um or that maybe an episiotomy scar has become tender and open using the cream externally on the vulva area um, very good. can be really soothing can't it um and actually, yeah. that's really interesting because I'm seeing, thankfully, more of my postnatal patients are being offered topical estrogen. Well, now that's great. Mm. Good. Because exactly so for those many reasons, of them are if, if he's the optimist scar, why would you not help yeah. somebody with that? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the women I know who are, you know, sort of more my age, their episiotomy scars and things are really giving them a lot of problems now. And, and sadly, few are offered you know something like Oviston or, or um and so that that's yeah good good to know um what about just lubricants if if um, yes and I think on... lubricants are really good so the reason we need them is that the tissue has changed so you asked me one other thing I would get women to do and that would be to look at your vagina take a picture you might want to move it off your mobile phone so it's not there in your general calendar in your general album <laughs> your kids to flick through no I'm sure there's a picture of the dog here oh that's not what I was looking oh. Um, but the reason I say that is because so often women will say, do you think my vagina, vagina's changed? And I go, I don't know. I didn't see it 20 years ago. You may or may not have somebody who saw it 20 years ago. They may have not or not have been noticing and they probably don't even care. So it's just that, just know what it looks like. Um, you know, we were talking about make friends with it because if you're not friends with your own vagina, then it's really hard to ask anyone else to be, I think. So take a picture and just keep a picture so that you can, you know, once a year, once every six months, it doesn't really need to be any more than that, but just so that you can see the changes. I think that's really, really helpful, particularly if you've got any scar tissue that's starting to look different or hurt, because then we do come on to lubricants. Um, and please do not, if you're using KJ, KJ, KY jelly out there, stop right now. Uh, so there's so many great organic silk. Yes, yes, yes. Great, great organic vaginal lubricants. You can either use a vaginal moisturizer generally, or if it's around sex, then I usually would recommend that you use a, an oil-based one personally, because you can put that in earlier. So some of the water-based ones are a little bit more liquid, which is, is what we want, but the oil-based can stay in a bit longer. So if you're still after a degree of spontaneity, um, then you can and think, oh yeah, maybe tonight is the night, then a little bit of an oil-based one, it's going to lubricate the areas. It's going to make you feel a whole load better whether you have sex or not. But it means that then if you do, and you can say to your partner, because we use a bit of lubricant, you're already a little bit more lubricated because the oil-based one can stay in for a little bit longer. So that can be really helpful as well. Thank you for talking about this, because I honestly think that so many women were like, but I used to be fine. And yes. then not understanding what actually happened because often you know periods are still relatively regular they don't know necessarily that it's changed by day or two yeah. so they don't notice but when you're like oh my goodness sex used to be absolutely fine and then now it's not comfortable and not realizing that actually using a bit of lubricant it's like when your skin gets a bit yeah. dry and you're like well I'm going to use a serum now no big deal but I'm going to use a serum get a bit of extra hydration in there it's the same thing it's the same tissue isn't it down down below it's I know and, and if you think about it it's, that's such a great analogy Linda it's such a great analogy because you know why would we yeah, we were talking about, I want to I want to be able to do all these things when I'm 60 when I'm 70 when I'm 80 um although my stepdaughter's in the corner she's already when I started talking about sex she legged it <laughs> um what you have sex um but um I just think that you know you're right we look after our facial skin we moan, yes. you know, I would never go out without sun factor on. And when yeah. I'm on holiday, I don't want my skin to get brown on my face anymore because it already looks old enough. Why would I not look after the skin elsewhere? Because that's a yes. really important part. So yeah, it's, it is fascinating, isn't it? And we just have to, if we can make people think about, yeah, okay, maybe I just need to give a bit of attention to both. Yeah. And yeah, it doesn't Absolutely. take long. I mean, it's just crazy how people will research and spend a lot of money on maybe getting Botox or, or, you know, special facials and all the rest of it. 
and yet wouldn't go to the chemist and get a bit of yes yeah what it's called yes yes yeah the product yeah so that they're a bit more comfortable downstairs instead you know maybe even stay at home because their knickers feel too uncomfortable to leave yeah. the house um you know if you're downstairs isn't happy you're not going to look happy up here no matter what you do to your face um so yes <laughs> and i always think it's a bit like toothache you can't ignore it there are certain you know if you've injured your arm a bit you can sometimes do other things and kind of work through that you can't pretend it's not okay down there because it's just something that will keep coming back and and i whilst you can't make something worse you can i believe you know someone say well you've got psychosomatic but if you're holding and if you're worried and if you're gripping subconsciously i know i would i used to get repeated utis usually triggered by driving because i couldn't get out of the car to go to the toilet long journeys um and i ha and you know the doctor you say oh well you know stop having so much sex I and mean, i'm not having any sex at the moment but that's okay I'll, I'll drive. Um, because that's always the easy option whatever I can't believe the doctor said that. Hurted, but at that point in time so but then what happened as I got older if I got stuck in a traffic jam I would be so stressed because I knew I couldn't go to the toilet so I have a thing if I'm seeing a lovely patient later today and we have a whole thing around the fact that car seats are made for men's bottoms not women's bottoms yes, so, yes I um, agree so with I think that. that would be okay because we've generally got smaller bottoms but we've got wider hips, so I don't think it is. So I think sometimes my skin is doing this because I'm, um, you know, I'm a little bit less buoyant and less, I've got less viscosity than I used to have. Mm -hmm. My skin's less plumped. I'm doing this and I'm holding because I don't know how long I'm gonna be stuck on the motorway. So it's not that I'm psychosomatic about the UTI, it's just that I brought all the tissues together in what is, as we know, a relatively dark, damp environment. Mm -hmm. So it's no, no real surprise. And the urethra is close to the vaginal opening. So guess what? I ended yes. with a UTI. So it's not that it's Bacteria. psychosomatic, it's the stress element yes. and the holding element that actually makes that an increased risk. So it's the tissue changes, the stress element, and then the holding. Yes. So all of those factor in. And you know, just on that, I'll just make this quick because, but it's relevant. Um, I've noticed with pro pelvic organ prolapse symptoms, so much worse when you're focusing on the prolapse. And when you decide to do something, you know, if you, you just do some proactive pelvis up, breathing work, Changing activation, it. change it. But if you're constantly focused on the, can't believe it's feeling so bad, what are they trying to work out what you did to make it feel bad at that moment in time? Um, or, or, you know, what will my partner think? The, the, the sensations are worse. It is, yes. there is definitely a psychosomatic element to, you can have a you know you can have stage two stage three prolapse um and it not be particularly symptomatic and you yeah. can have a stage one and it really not being a problem yeah. you know physically at all and yet it caused you so much anxiety so yeah interesting isn't it the relaxation of yoga is doesn't it good we've got some it's good just, it tools is, here. Yes, it is and it's just you know Sometimes you don't even have to be thinking about the pelvic floor, do you? You just need to get that relaxation, check whether they're holding at the yeah, jaw. Yeah, the jaw. The and cheeks. I, you know, who doesn't love legs up against the wall with a, with the pelvic up a little bit? Because you're automatically getting the legs arresting, so everything can release automatically without you even focusing on it too much. Yes. Yeah. Um, you the get exhale, the breathing. It's yeah. longer. Yes. We so stimulate just, the vagus yeah. nerves. Yeah. Lots of good tools. Okay, so that that that's all. So tell me. So so they've got potentially um, pelvic oestrogen uh, or vaginal oestrogen um, or potentially systematic oestrogen to, to, to help with the HRT. Um, we, we looked at, you know, stress and worry is a, is a component there. Things will feel worse, potentially be worse if you are focused and yeah. stressed. What else? What else can women, should women be doing in their lives in order to increase pelvic floor function and make sex potentially something that they do <laughs> <laughs> still enjoy i mean i think you know the other you've got to keep moving you've got to keep moving um we need to lubricate all of these you know most of our joints are you know they need to be lubricated so you you need to move it's synovial joints we need to move to keep what viscosity we've got left moving and if you're able to move and your hips move well then you know the uh, we know that the inner thighs the adductors eventually go into the pelvic floor through the beta and i so if you are not moving well if you're not moving in all sorts of functional ways, that's not gonna help either. So being seated too much, and I think we've all been in that category during COVID, 
you know, things will have seized up a little bit. And partly it is going through menopause and, and we can get achy joints and things like that and achy joints and muscles. But if you think about wanting the pelvic floor to be healthy, we have to still move. You need to be able to rotate through the hips, don't you? You need to be able to do what is a squat for you. So making sure, you know, feet, knees, hips, all of those back. So that's why some of the movements that we do in yoga are so brilliant for just moving everything through the body. So, you know, it's about moving. It's all about keeping on moving. That means that you help with that because then the pelvic floor it doesn't coexist on its own you know it isn't just the pelvic floor it's not attached to anything else it is attached to your legs the the pelvic floor muscles at the front will also therefore be attached to your lower transverse abdominal muscles so again where are you with that are you bracing are you able to engage those muscles and have them working in synergy rather than bracing and pushing down which again talking prolapse bracing and pushing down the pelvic floor we need the pelvic floor to come up work in synergy with the lower transverse abdominal muscles I know that, you know, how are you with your glutes? How are you with piriformis? I did the, um, the abduction. Um, I don't yeah. usually do that in the gym. And I've been feeling a little bit, I've got a bit of a sort of right hamstring thing going on. And I did it and I tell you, I could feel it in my pelvic floor. I was like, oh dear Lord, I talk to women about this. And now I've just yeah. felt it. Um, and it was fascinating. I was like, well, okay. you know, anatomically, I know why that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when I'm running, because, which I don't, well, the jogging would be a better word, but when I do that and I've got this bit of a hamstring going on, I think I've been holding and my, my probably my biomechanics have changed. So yes. that part of my pelvic floor has been holding a bit. So yes. no reason not to run in your 50s, etc. You can carry on doing that. But it's just thinking about making everything work then. So I, I think there was some holding going on. So I had to go back and reassess how I was moving and what was going on. And could I relax that area to bring mm -hmm. everything back? That real motion is lotion isn't it yes. and and we always say train your body to run don't yeah. run to train the body because it's just you yeah. know like you said that that I, I i found over lockdown just before i was trying to launch the women's well-being site i was doing lots of sitting and normally like right now i desperately need to stand up and move because i don't like sitting for such a long time but i was doing lots of sitting and even when my brain was going get up get up get up get up your bum is sore get up I, I was trying to finish things off. Yeah. Now, I experienced for the first time in my life the, the, the like a sudden gripping around my performance and it went into around my tailbone. And I felt that almost like it just went. Yeah. And, and interestingly, I had just literally been writing about this phenomenon in, in one of the articles. And, and, and I had been working with a client on tension around this area. And my God, it has, it's, it's still to this day, a little bit of a trigger for me yeah. now. If I do too much sitting, it's, it's something that's obviously just gone boom. Um, and I was stressed. I probably wasn't breathing properly. I probably wasn't drinking nearly as yeah. much water as I normally do. I certainly wasn't moving like I normally do. And boom, that, that little tension got there. So interesting to, like you, I'm, I'm going, oh, how fascinating. Yeah. All of the pre-factors all this stuff it's not discretionary it's not like oh because you're a yoga teacher i'm not gonna, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. like we've all got to do the work yeah. don't we we've yeah. all got to make daily habits to look at to maintain the vehicle um so yeah that that was that's good good um good bring me up just that motion is is, is lotion yeah. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you think that women yeah, I mean, I think, really should I mean, be doing I, in their life? I feel I feel I would say that if you have changes, try and go and see somebody. You don't need loads of treatment. You, I mean, I, I quite often might see women twice. That that might be it. I will see them. I have the luxury of assessing through ultrasound externally. So I'm looking at the breath movement, the pelvic floor movement, asking people to breathe. And then if I then say, do what you're doing when you're lifting something, do what you're doing when your pelvic floor, and they suddenly have less movement that tells me it's not just strength that we need from them, it's also length that we need. That tells me where I can go with that. You probably just need, you know, one assessment, then you've got the, that, so that's the first thing, because why would you not, if you can afford to do it, um, why would you not just have one or two checks on that? And then off you can go with that. It would, it should just be really, really easy to do. So the ultrasound helps me have a biofeedback. It always helps the, my patient have a biofeedback. Mm -hmm. And then once you know, so it was like, yeah, we, there's nothing wrong with pelvic floor exercises, but before you do them, know your starting point. That's what, so that's a kind of know thing thyself, saying, know your, know know thyself. your baseline. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So if you think, because otherwise, oh, if I just, if you're somebody who's a bit, you like the gym and you like lifting and all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to carry on. Well, it might not need lifting. It might only be working. If it's not working through that and it's only working here, 
lifting it more here isn't going to help it do that or get up to here. So that that's my you know, know what you've got, know what you're dealing with. Um, check then your status around lubrication, check your status around all of that and then work it in. So I tend to do my pelvic floor lower abdominal exercises when I am in the gym doing biceps or a chest press because I'm exhaling on effort. So I do it at the same time. Find a way to link that in, if not on a daily basis, three or four times a week. Be patient, keep your relaxation going so that you get the whole of those muscles to relax at some point, just you know, with your yoga, with your legs up against the wall. Check your hydration because we talk about viscosity. Are we drinking enough water? Now, I am a coffee fiend. I am an absolute coffee fiend. Whoa. But on my Whoa. list, of, I know, on my list of things to do is I am working to, and I do love a coffee. I mean, I almost, yes. I almost like I have a ventilator to smell. Oh, I just like the taste. I love the smell. Uh, yeah. I love the smell. But I am not having as many. And mm. that's, that's feel because I was feeling a bit palpitation wise. I was like, mm. Mm. not mm. having as many. Be honest about what you are eating. So, yeah. you know, keep a food diary just for a couple of days. Not because you shouldn't have things, but I'm a great one for, it's not a treat if you have it every day. It's actually part of it. It's a habit, isn't it? It's yeah, it's now, it's now a habit. So spend a little bit of time being honest about what you're eating. Have things, I mean, certainly during lockdown, have things crept in. So I'm a bit more now of a, you know, a quick release carb person than I would have been. So is that not helping? You know, for, for good for good bowel habits, I love a couple of prunes a day. I'm ne I've never been that regular, but they just for me, other people, you might need something else. But make sure that you are having you're maintaining regularity in bowel habits regular for you. you if you've yes. if you've only ever gone once a day, don't suddenly expect me to go three times. You won't. But make sure you are regular for you and keep that. We need to keep that moving. But that's why movement itself. Lotion is motion. It will keep that motion going <laughs> as well. And then, you know, sleep is always a challenge, isn't it? But um, I often say, you know, maybe you need to change your sleeping position. Certainly, if you've slept on the same shoulder for 20 plus years, then quite often I'll see patients and they'll say, well, by the way, my shoulder's a bit sore. And I said, have you slept, slept on the same side of the bed for 20 years? So, well, you know, maybe maybe switch it around. That might that might help your sex life. I yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, just that little bit of time, isn't it? Just to spend thinking about what you really want going forward and knowing that we can't change everything, nor should we necessarily, but starting to think about what the you for the next 30 or 40 years is going to be. Mm, and that's a big one and it can be overwhelming, but I think, you know, and the younger generation is so much better at recognising that self-care is fundamental that yeah. we had to fill up our own cup before we can flow over to other people. I think, you know, we're kind of still, and definitely the people, you know, above us, the women above us are still a little bit like, you know, you have to prove your worth by being ultra busy and yeah. doing all the things for other people all the time. And really at midlife, it's got to be bollocks to that. Yeah. And if you don't look after yourself, not just you, but everybody around you suffers and it's the most selfless thing you can do taking some time out looking at your body your mind the people around you what brings you joy and just yeah. you know yeah. making All some of, decisions yes. about going forward and it, it is hard but you know and, and Helen Mirren has some great quotes on this doesn't she had to give less yeah. about what other people think and I think you naturally do that a little bit but that putting yourself first for women of our generation it, you know isn't natural but it's not being selfish but it means that if I manage to find that time for me I'm actually a much more a much more happy person to hang out with mm. my, my partner it's, it's his daughter's birthday he clearly knows when it's his daughter's birthday um he doesn't have a card yet so I'm thinking oh can I fit that in between talking to Linda seeing a patient uh. and I'm like actually but you know what we can send it tomorrow maybe he sh maybe he should take responsibility am I not maybe I'm not helping him but that's what we do isn't it so actually yes. I can take that 15 minutes and just have a glass Put of your legs up the wall and I think for a glass of water absolutely, absolutely. so I do think, and, and it's, you know what, the other thing I say is it just stop beating yourself up quite so much when you don't manage to lie with your legs up against the wall or you get to the end of the day and you haven't, you know, because it, it takes these things, you know how long we say what it takes a long time to make a habit, it's a long time to give something up, it takes a long time to get these self-care habits in. So just do it and be a little bit more, a bit kinder to yourself. We are kinder to everyone else other than ourselves and usually our significant others, I find. <laughs> Yes. So maybe it can be more like a two year plan or something yes. like that. We're just sort of working these little bits in and then in two years we'll reassess. But yeah, yeah trying to do it all in one go. Because you're not, it's, you know that with anything. It's like even if you just took a fitness goal and said, OK, I'm just going to run. 
but no we need more things to support us this time like so it is about it is about balance isn't it it really is about balance and then hopefully still having great sex at the end of yes it. yes <laughs> well, because, because if you look after you then you feel but then you feel good about you then you want to have so so it is just having that bit of time and you know and i don't you know i know when we started i don't know that we thought we were going to talk about sex and it's not but i definitely see it more and more in clinic because i think it's probably one of the only times that women actually feel they, they can talk about it because they don't necessarily want to talk about it with their mates because we all think our mates are having great sex. They're probably, yeah. well, they may be, I hope they are, but I suspect they aren't all. So, you know, that's an incontinence we just don't talk about really. Yes. So let's all talk about sex and incontinence yeah. a little bit more. Oh, <laughs> uh, Listen, Sarah, I know you've got to go. Thank you so much for coming and just talking about bits and pieces, our bits and pieces with me today. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that this information will be super helpful to lots of ladies. It's been a pleasure. Um, I've got Sarah's details in the uh, therapy tent. So all her details are there. She's an amazing therapist to go and see. So if you are looking to um, have some help and to know thyself better, she is a one wonderful woman to have her fingers go up your bits and pieces and, <laughs> <Yes. use. laughs> and just chat. She might not. She might just chat. <laughs> is, that, is that a nice sign off? <laughs> it's a lovely sign off. Thank you. I shall hold that thought for the rest of my day. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much, Linda. Take, Take care. care. Bye.